For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Percy Bice Shelley, who was born on the 4th of August, 1792, was one of the major English Romantic poets. In fact, Percy Shelley was considered by many of his contemporaries to be among the finest English language lyric and philosophical poets, and certainly one of the most influential. Labeled as a radical in his poetry as well as in his political and social views, Shelley did not garner much celebrity during his lifetime, yet appreciation of his accomplishments in poetry grew increasingly following his untimely death, having ironically drowned in a sudden storm while yachting off the Italian coast on the 8th of July, 1822. That is less than one month before his 30th birthday. Even so, over the course of his brief literary career, Shelley succeeded in becoming a central member of a close circle of visionary poets and writers that included Lord Byron, John Keats, Lee Hunt, Thomas Love Peacock, and his own second wife, Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley, author of the 1818 novel Frankenstein. As a final point, in 1817, or the year prior to his wife Mary's noteworthy success, Shelley wrote what many regard to be his greatest work, a political poem called Ozymandias. Written at a time when Napoleon Bonaparte's domination of Europe had come to a crashing end, and yet another empire, that of Great Britain's, was on the cusp of ascendancy. Shelley's immortal lines encapsulated metaphorically the outcome of such tyrannical wielding of power, that no leader or ruler or king or dictator or despot can overcome. Time. I met a traveler from an antique land who said, Two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passions read, which yet survive, having stamped on these lifeless things the hand that mocked them and the heart that fed. And on the pedestal these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, king of kings, Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. I am not mighty, quite the contrary, in fact, and yet, as I read these lines and looked upon the decrepit works of Ozymandias, the Greek name for the Egyptian pharaoh Ramses II, I did, and still do, despair for him and for those of us like him, because the simple but tragic truth is that Way too many of us spend our entire lives building up kingdoms, these little empires that fade into nothingness, shockingly soon after our earthly departure. Instead of spending our lives building up treasures in heaven, that is, eternal things, we look for our treasures on earth, that is, temporal things in direct contravention of what Jesus Christ exhorts the original hearers of his Sermon on the Mount in St. Matthew chapters 5 to 7, and all of us human beings today to do. As we read in St. Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 to 21, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And again, he says in verse 33, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. 
Now, the hard truth is we all run after, or better still, worship something like money or possessions or clothing or food or fame or power or intelligence or good looks and so on. Nonetheless, these things are all temporary. They fade away and we can't take them with us when we die. Moreover, if we are busy worshiping something other than God, and again at times we all do, then we are being idolatrous, which by the way is the epitome, the height of sin, as we are literally worshiping created things instead of the Creator who made them. Furthermore, what we spend our precious time doing reflects what we value. And what we value, in turn, reflects how loving or unloving our souls are. So, do we spend an inordinate amount of time chasing after money or fame or food or possessions? More revealing still, do we spend hours and days simply worrying about our ability to acquire such things? Consequently, and perhaps most telling, do our worries relegate us to constantly living in and for the future? Case in point, in a former life as a consultant in the never-ending search for new clients and the constant servicing of existing contracts, I was forever living at least 68 weeks in the future, never for today. Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't be prudent and plan ahead for things like children's welfare and education or for our retirement needs. But for us to never stop and smell the roses is certainly not what God intended for us. Because the sad reality is, for many people, tomorrow never comes. For example, how many people have ever lamented on their deathbeds that they wish they had spent more time at the office? I know of one person in particular who shared with me not that long ago that the sudden death of someone close to him immediately caused him to reevaluate and restructure exactly how he would spend his limited and precious time upon this earth from then on which vividly illustrates why endlessly worrying about tomorrow's needs or cares is such a waste and an unproductive use of one's time, as it really eats into one's enjoyment of today. The theme for which, being the 20th Sunday after Trinity, is cheerful obedience and service to God. In today's epistle lesson from Ephesians chapter 5, St. Paul exhorts us in verses 18b to 19 to spiritual joyfulness when he writes, Be filled with the Spirit, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. This unsurpassable joy which permeates the lives of all true believers in Jesus Christ is one of the great sources of spiritual strength and progress. For the truly Christian life is not one of downcast eyes, but of cheerfulness. The connection between today's epistle lesson and today's colic, then, is quite clear. As the colic, as the colic's petitions closely reiterate the teachings of the epistle lesson, First of all, we pray to be kept from all hurtful things which hinder us from cheerful service. We pray, O Almighty and most merciful God, of thy bountiful goodness keep us, we beseech thee, from all things that may hurt us, including, as the epistle warns us in verses 17 to 18a, from the carelessness and laziness and self-indulgence with which we are often also tempted. Secondly, the colic concludes that, thus guarded and guided, we may cheerfully accomplish the things which God would have us do in the joyful spirit as described by St. Paul in the epistle lesson. We pray that we, being ready both in body and soul, may cheerfully accomplish those things that thou wouldest have done through Jesus Christ our Lord. In addition, the collect also takes its meaning from the gospel lesson for today, from St. Matthew chapter 22, verses 1 to 14, or the parable of the marriage feast of the king's son. 
owing to the fact that, according to Holy Scripture, Jesus related this particular parable on the Tuesday of Holy Week, that is, only three days before his crucifixion, this most profound and telling and urgent parable contrasts the divine privileges to which all humanity is invited with the dangers of being overly absorbed in the cares and the anxieties of the world. As we are told in verse 5, the invited guests in Jesus' parable not only refused the king's generous invitation and went their separate ways, but they made light of it as well. Moreover, in verse 6, some of the invitees even went so far as to seize the king's servants and treated them spitefully, in other words, tortured them, and then killed them. Clearly depicting what the Jews, particularly the rulers and religious leaders over the course of Israel's sordid history, made of Almighty God's direct commands and inflicted on his many prophets sent to warn them to change their sinful behavior. Hence, our earnest request in today's collect is that we will not be like those who refused and abused the king's invitation, but rather that we will accept the gracious invitation of Jesus Christ to come to him to receive his salvation, and thus, cleansed of our sins, faithfully serve him all the rest of our earthly days, that we, being ready both in body and soul, may cheerfully accomplish those things that thou wouldest have done. Whereas the first part of Jesus' parable, that is verses 2 to 10, speaks of God's rejection of Israel as a nation 2,000 years ago, the parable's second part, that's verses 11 to 14, in which a man not having a wedding garment is thrown out of the feast, deals with the responsibility of the individual today. Hence, the wedding garment symbolizes the righteousness and the purity and the holiness that God himself, as the gracious host of the feast, provides for all who accept his priceless invitation, as bestowed upon all true believers through his son's broken body and shed blood, as well as nurtured throughout their lives by the Holy Spirit, that without which no one shall get to spend eternity with God at heaven's wedding feast. In other words, Almighty God issues an undeserved invitation to undeserving people and in addition provides in himself the righteousness the invitation demands. In short then, God has done all the work and we need only to accept his gracious offer and put on that wedding garment, put on Jesus Christ. Accordingly, each time we attend Holy Communion, we must similarly prepare to approach our Lord's table, his wedding feast on earth, if you will, with our hearts and our minds and our entire selves clothed with Jesus Christ's holiness and his love and his joyfulness, as instructed in our Book of Common Prayer on page 90, as per, per the words of the second exhortation, which says, so that you may come holy and clean to such a heavenly feast in the marriage garment required by God in Holy Scripture and be received as worthy partakers of that holy table. God invites us to his holy table to receive the body and the blood of his Son, Jesus Christ, so that as we petition in the prayer of humble access, as found on page 84 of the Book of Common Prayer, our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body and our souls washed through his most precious blood. Thus, let us dare not refuse our Lord's most gracious invitation, but rather let us come to his wedding feast with cheerful and loving hearts, for many are invited, but few choose to be chosen. May today's collect then become our fervent and daily prayer, that we may be ready both in body and soul to serve him, and that we may cheerfully accomplish all those things that he wouldest have done. Therefore, this 20th Sunday after Trinity, not tomorrow, but today, right now, in fact, 
Let us each, as St. Paul exhorts in his first general epistle to Timothy, chapter 6, verse 12, fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and for which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. And starting today, let us heed the very clear warning as sounded by the poet, Percy Shelley, through his timeless words regarding the sobering lesson of Ozymandias, King of Kings, otherwise known as the Egyptian pharaoh Ramses II, who foolishly chose to build up his treasures on earth, where moth and rust certainly did destroy. Instead, this day and every day thereafter, let us always be, as the author of Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, wisely counsels, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And finally, from this day forward, let us seek first God's kingdom in all things, and they shall be added unto us, both now in our daily lives as true Christians, and forevermore at his eternal wedding feast. For where our hearts are, there shall our treasures forever be. Let us pray. Almighty God, who has given a day of rest to thy people, and through thy spirit in the church hast consecrated the first day of the week to be a perpetual memorial of thy son's resurrection, grant that we may so use thy gift, that refreshed and strengthened in soul and body, we may serve thee faithfully all the days of our life. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.